first I want to thank David and Blanca and Angel and Clemente and everybody else. I already learned a lot and enjoyed a lot and I think that's the main point of my uh, being here and my talk to enjoy each other and to learn from each other. Um, I am uh, unfortunately Byzantinist, <laughs> but uh, when I started thinking about René Girard, and I must confess that the only thing I actually read uh, before you called me was this thing, to the end. yeah, in English. In English, yeah. Uh, because that's easier to find on the internet. And my students know how to do that. <laughs> so, the, and but I was so fascinated with uh, Girard. My idea was, I am specialized in Byzantine studies and medieval Balkans. But uh, I, during my studies, and after that, uh, I was always interested in contemporary history. But given to the structure of the university and my faculty, I had to choose one stuff. And I always knew I wanted to do Byzantine stuff. Why? Because it's very complicated. And I'm, that's my curse maybe, that's my, uh, I always, the complicated things fascinate me. And Byzantium, which is actually the, the Roman Empire, mm. it always fascinated me. And there's another empire, the American Empire, that's now in the last 15 years really started to fascinate me. So we can, in the discussion, draw some parallels with also the contemporary American politics and contemporary history. But I already talked about the 1990s in Greece on a couple of occasions and in Cyprus because people want to know about it. And although it was always in Greek, I think. Mm. But it's nevertheless, excuse my English, that's, that's I wanted to start with that. In the sense, I would prefer to speak in Spanish, but then that would, that would mean that I would have to write it in English and Blanca would have to translate it in Spanish and that's too complicated <laughs> and I'm too lazy for that. So, And also I don't, I don't like to, to read uh, in this kind of seminars. I think that the, 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 the I mean, it's uh, spoken word, it's much more effective. Later I can write something something down. So I'm not inexperienced in the modern Balkan history, but as you can see, I have, I don't know how many slides, let me check, 13 or 14? 13 slides. And some of them are really, there's a lot of te text in them. So uh, as Clemente says, I'm coming from a kind of positivistic history, but I always, even when I was studying history, I try to fight this positivistic approach, sometimes even openly with my professors, which, uh, well, it turned out well in the end, but it wasn't always pleasant. Because uh, this straight line thinking, you know, this linear, logic, positivistic, causal thing, I always was searching for something uh, deeper, uh, for some tools, as you said, that can help me understand some processes. And as we will see here in the next, maybe, I'll try to keep it at 30 minutes, please. Uh, even more. <laughs> well, we can discuss later, but yes, I don't like to talk that long. You know, I can talk for a long time, but, uh, you know, it's, <laughs> it, would, it will be boring. But uh, uh, another complex thing is the history of the Balkans, and especially the Yugoslav case. And when I did this, those presentations in, in, in um, Greece and Cyprus, it made me think, not only think back in my memories, but it's so complicated because we were always now scholars in Serbian, this former Yugoslavia region. We were looking for the origin, the, the starting point of the feuds, of the, of the starting point of the conflicts, rivalries. <coughs> when was this identity uh, a, a struggle against the identity? When it started? And we always tend to go further and further back in the history. Of course, we always finish in the Middle Ages. Of course, uh, especially during the, the social Yugoslavia, people at least were good historians, so they would stop at the seventh century after Christ, when the, both Croats and Slavs and other Slavic people came to the Balkans. Mm -hmm. But in this post-socialism, this new capitalism period, this transitional period, the new 
breed of historians or historians actually emerged, these pseudo pseudo historians that uh, came with all sorts of autochthonic theories that the Croats were there before everybody else, that the Serbs were there before everybody else, that the Bulgarians were there before everybody, before the Romans, before everybody else. So <laughs> it's really complicated. One good thing that we managed to do in Belgrade and in Zagreb, in Croatia also, we managed to keep those kind of pseudo-historians away from the university, from the official mm -hmm. academia, which uh, maybe uh, it's self-congratulatory, -con -con but uh, you know now nowadays I, I have the feeling that the uh, social media is becoming more, in a way, inf um, not maybe not more important, but uh, more influential than uh, official academia, and we are all uh, too lazy or too proud or some combination of those things to engage too much on social media, especially because the, the other guys are really not very nice people. And so they're winning in the way in, in this kind of um, general opinion. So if you if, if you do the poll now of the people in Croatia, Serbia, um, uh, also Bulgaria, at least 50% of the population believes in these kind of autochthonic theories, which is terrible. Mm -hmm. and one of the reasons is positivistic history. It's our, our fault because the way we teach history is terrible. I don't know about you, but I hate history in school. <laughs> in elementary school, in high school, I really hated history because it, I have uh, kids now both in high school and in elementary school, and I'm always complaining. Uh, fortunately, Nobelgrad is also kind of, I mean, it's a big place, but it's a small place, and a lot of my students are now teachers in the high school, so uh, my, my kids, uh, I mean, their teachers know were my former students, so they get by, but the way we teach history, we really should think about it. And uh, uh, this kind of tools is very important. There's going to be a lot of um, Girardian thing or stuff like that in this presentation. But I, what I want to start with is actually um, this. Uh, I don't want to read everything. But when I was uh, holding those lectures in Greece and Cyprus, maybe you would think, OK, Greece is in the Balkans geographically. But they don't know anything about the Balkans. I mean, they know a few things about maybe what is now called Macedonia, and that's it. They know maybe a few things about Bulgaria, and that's about it. They don't know anything about the Balkans, except that we're, uh, I mean, the Bulgarians, Serbs, and Greece, we're all Orthodox brothers uh, under the courts. That, that's, that's the limit of their knowledge, and I'm talking about our colleagues in, in academia, not about the, the common people. So I was struck. The, 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 the level of ignorance about the, the Balkans and the medieval history of Balkans and the contemporary Balkans really struck me when I was starting to teach in Cyprus and, and in Greece and to engage with my colleagues, even those who teach uh, contemporary history, because a lot of them teach Greek history or, I don't know, European history or American contemporary history. And this is just two examples. That's why I actually... Um, now we have a new program in Belgrade. It's going to start next year or year after that. About we try to interconnect different disciplines, and I have courses on the contemporary Balkans mm -hmm. and cri crisis in the Southeast Europe and Eastern Mediterranean. So that I could include also Cypriot crisis. Mm -hmm. uh, two names that you might be familiar with. One is uh, Mark Mazower. He's uh, of Greek origin. Professor at uh, now he's uh, in uh, the Princeton University. He was in uh, Oxford or Cambridge. No, I'm always making that kind of mistake. But he wrote a lot of books about, generally speaking, Balkans. And uh, the most famous is called The Balkans. It's still, I would argue, the best short history of the Balkans. It's really hard to write stuff like that. He managed <laughs> to do it really good. I mean, it's, he starts from the 15th, 16th century until the, the, the end of, the, I think, 20th century. It's, it's really the best. It's been translated immediately in uh, Greek, and as far as I know, that's the only language in the, and, and in Bulgarian also. Of course, in Serbian, there, there, there's no translation of, uh, of Mazover's books for some reason. Uh, and um, the other is Maria Todorova. She's a Bulgarian scholar. Mm -hmm. 
working also very influentially in the U.S. Uh, cultural historian. Her most famous book is Imagining Balkans. So not, not imaginary, but imagining Balkans. That um, she describes the views of the Western um, travelers and scholars later of the Balkans. It's a kind of uh, orientalizing discourse in the in the footsteps of Edward Said's uh, Orientalism that has a lot of good points in it, some also bad points, but at least uh, we can draw those good points and his discourse on the, of the, this, in a way, colonial or post-colonial colonial approach to the Eastern questions, so including the Balkans. But as you can see there in these two uh, paragraphs, um, the Balkans is still kind of unknown land. And the people who write about Balkans usually come from the Balkans. They're very rare. So the, I, I say either the creators of the image of the Balkans origin from the areas, in the case of both Mazover and Todorova, or the impression by strangers, by strange, that's why it's called, eventually uh, become accepted by the natives. I call them natives, <laughs> all of us. So the Balkan you know, scholars. It's a kind of um, um, complex of, um, what's it called, lesser value? Uh, of inferiority, complex of inferiority that uh, we have in the Balkans in um, uh, well, huge uh, grade. And it's also, uh, I noticed and I, I've spoken about it uh, with my friends and also the university in Cyprus, this inferiority complex. So, so you have feel the need uh, to accept somebody else's opinion because they are more cultivated, under quotes, than you are. And, and this is the problem, and I will come back to that at the end of this talk, that's the problem of elites versus the common people. The elites have this terrible complex of inferiority in the Balkans, I don't know why. I mean, we, we can argue about the, the reasons, uh, maybe because we were the, of all this negative selection in the Balkans, starting with, um, well, before, actually, First World War, uh, but especially after the First World War, the, the, the continuous negative selection. So you're always being amazed how people succeed in those kind of environments, especially if you're not a part of that, that environment. So, for example, for me, the success of, uh, let's say, some football player, basketball player, Novak Djokovic. You know, Novak Djokovic is the number one in the world. It's unbelievable. You know? Although, in a way, I, I prefer Rafa Nadal, which is not, in a way, as personality. He's more, yeah. more my, my kind of guy, my kind of personality, more fiery than mm. Djokovic. But what he managed to do, and a lot of people, in, also in academia, uh, surprise people from the outside, from the civilized world mm -hmm. from the western world so that have a complex of superiority so that, that is something that I never understood why uh, and I know that among, among my colleagues a lot of them majority of them have this complex of inferiority there's also opportunistic um, element in there because you know when you accept somebody else's opinion then that somebody can uh, give you some benefits uh, and you become beneficiary of funds and stuff like that you always have to have this practical thing in mind but actually that is the the the, the way how the view of the Balkans uh, was created Mark Mazur uh, this it's a tiny book I mean it's maybe 150 pages so it's nothing given the topic I mean mm. it's it's a very good solid book but it's very short uh, it's the only one that goes through Balkans. Although he has some peculiar, um, not interests, but uh, he focuses on, on some peculiar topics. One of them is Macedonia. And I will come back to Macedonia at the very end because that's the current issue now. Mm. Very, um, well, now it's become more or less, it, it's a done deal, but it was for the last couple of years, that's the main focus point, the trouble point mm. in, in the Balkans. But 
The point of this first slide is, is what Mark Mazower said, on the lookout for evidence of Balkan bloodthirstiness. So the Western travelers, uh, commentators and scholars, and I use Western in the, in the broad sense, in a way even Russian travelers have the same. Uh, so they are outsiders, maybe it's mm. better to say outsiders view. So they have, they, they presume that the Balkans are this, uh, you know, uh, wild wood left in the 19th century history. So they look out for the evidence of their attitude and Western observers have often mistaken the myths spun by 19th century romantic nationalists for eternal truth. This is a, maybe it's too positivistic, but that's the main point yeah, and main point, problem actually in understanding the Balkans. That uh, we think the, and the, the images that all the troubles stem from the, from the Middle Ages. That's just the 19th century myth, because the 19th century was the period of the establishment of the nation states, and that's when all these small nations started to connect with the Middle Ages. So it's not continuous it's historical development from the Middle Ages, it's just the 19th century myth. And there's been a very good historical, huge historical series uh, about the nationalisms and the nation states and writing and rewriting national histories in the 19th century, uh, maybe four or five, now six volumes, but you know what's missing? The Balkans. And this, uh, uh, concretely Serbia. And 19th century Serbia, it's all about the glory of the Middle Ages, of our medieval empire, and how we're going to rebuild our middle, uh, medieval empire. It's 19th century, it's 20th century. And you know, we, we all know how it ended in the 1990s. In the 1990s, it was resurrected, that, that myth of re-establishing the empire of the emperor Stefan, Stephen Dushan. Yeah. You know, he was the, the first and, as I like to say to my students, the first and second to last, because his son was the last emperor. We only had two emperors. <laughs> uh, Timothy Gartunesh is a kind of historian, but he's a journalist. But this is the, 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 what I want to, to, to stress is the, the, the second point. Uh, the my mistaken idea that the wars of the Yugoslav succession were the inevitable product of centuries-old ancestral hatred rein, reinforced the reluctance of Western governments to become involved there. Okay, the, the, the last part is about uh, Western politics, but this, he, he got it right here, although he was wrong on, on many other things. And he's probably as far as intellectuals go, the um, uh, most, um, um, well, he's, a, he's the, the, the man after the, the fall of the Berlin Wall, he created this myth, in a way, of Central Europe and left Southeast Europe, the Balkans, out of the Europe. And we know what happened. Just If you leave the Balkan people alone, they will start to fight each other. That's inevitable. That's like histor we have historical evidence because he created that myth of Central Europe, especially Poland, Czech Republic, now Slo Slovakia, uh, being the, uh, the the natural uh, part of the Europe. Europe, he left the, all all of us down there, you know, to um, to our, our own devices. And I think that he, in the last couple of years he accepted that, but he was criticized by, by some very smart people. I had a huge bibliography on that. Um, there's one term. Terms, language, symbols do matter. Balkan, I don't know, do you say in Spanish something about Balkan? When you say Balkan, do you have some... Balkanes? Balkanes. No, but uh, do you have something like a noun, like balkanization idea? Sí, yeah. Balkanización. Yeah. Balkanización, Balkanización, so it's the same. Yes. Do you have say, about Byzantine, do, when you say... Byzantine. Ah, yeah. Uh, you when don't you have, have this... a dispute, do you have a, a discussion, uh, uh, and you never end the discussion in the discussion without sense, you call it a Byzantine discussion, una discussion yeah. Byzantina. Eh? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So you, it's just something that goes on forever. <laughs> and yeah. so you have this... Uh, Measurative <laughs> meaning, like in English, especially in British English, Byzantine with small b is something uh, that you know the K 
can do something tricky, uh, dirty. So names have, I mean, words, terms are really important. So balkanization, when you say Balkan, it's like explosion, you know. So now, that's why now politically correct term, if you want to apply for European funds, you have to write Southeast Europe. <laughs> because nobody wants to give money for the Balkans because you're just gonna go and eat chevapchichi, you know, that's all, just eat something. Uh, but the last thing, um, where is this? What is Balkanization? The, the, yeah, it's also in, in the first, this may be the dream, this is another book by Mark Mazur. Mm -hmm. uh, governing the world, the history of an idea about the, the creation of the United Nations. Mm -hmm. it's, it's a huge book and I really actually, Mark Mazur is one of the uh, few maybe historians that I can read now. When I was younger I could read everything, now I just don't have, I don't know, patience, I guess. So uh, it's all boring to me. Uh, his books uh, I can really read. Uh, yeah. So this is about Balkanization. Uh, it's, it's, it's a historical experience called Balkanization, which means a client rights of small states uh, or small groupings of weak states fiercely divided among themselves by nationalists, feuds governed by unstable popular autocracies unaccustomed in, to international law and diplomatic practice as they are to parliamentary government and a battleground for the surrounding great powers. This terrible sentence. <laughs> but actually, barbarians who uh, don't know anything, don't have, have democratic traditions. They, they, they are always governed by uh, um, autocratic populists. They don't have institutions and they uh, fight between themselves for no reason. That's Balkanization. It's a, it's a, unfortunately, it's a pretty correct uh, definition. I wanna, because that, that's, but I would argue that's not uh, unique for that region. You have it everywhere. It's just that we lag, I mean, the Balkans lag behind other European regions, uh, half a century or a century or a couple of centuries. It's just that it, it happened everywhere. And I would argue some of those, um, you know, characterizations could be applied to more to the contemporary United States than some Balkan. Mm -hmm. we'll, we can talk about that. But th this is how people understood 19th and 20th century, early 20th century Balkans. When after the, this, you know, when you look at the maps, I couldn't find good maps, and I apologize for that. Uh, all these maps are that I could find are really, really, were really terrible. So, uh, map of 19, let's say, let's go a little bit back, 18, um, 1800, you have Austrian Empire, still only Austrian Empire, and you have Turkish Empire. Then, uh, in, in the middle of the 19th century, you have now Austrian, Austrian-Hungarian Empire, you have tiny Serbia, you have tiny Greece, and you have Ottoman Empire. And then it goes step by step, 1878, the, the uh, Congress in, in Berlin, you have bigger Serbia, you have tiny little Montenegro, you have bigger Bulgaria, you have Greece, uh, but only southern Greece, and you have <coughs> Ottoman Empire and Austrian-Hungarian Empire. And then come the, the Balkan, the first Balkan Wars. 1912-1913, uh, when we, in the first Balkan War in 1912, there was a coalition between uh, of Serbia, Montenegro, Bulgaria, and Greece to de defeat the Turks, and they managed to do that. What happened in the very next year? There was a second Balkan War, Serbs uh, 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 and, uh, and Montenegros against Bulgarians, and Bulgarians against Greeks, of course fight for the territories and, uh, in a way, colonies. So that was 19th Balkan Wars, and then we come to, uh, this is what I, what I want, and then we come to 1914. But before that 1914, this is the famous Eastern question, you know, that, uh, that actually in the, in the second half of the, of the 19th century, the, the big, um, the heads of the Western states, Germany, France, Austria, Hungarian Empire, 
they were uh, Russia, of course, and the UK. They were uh, thinking for generations how to, uh, in a way, push the Turks outside of Europe and what to do with these emerging national movements that were Serbian, Greek, Bulgarian, and not only, that were threatening to destroy their, their own empires, especially the Austrian-Hungarian empires, empire, because you have, of course, Austrians are just uh, part of a kind of bigger German nation, and then you have Hungarians who were very, uh, um, I don't know how, the population of Hungary in Austrian-Hungarian Empire was bigger than the population of the German-speaking lands. And then you have within that empire a huge number of Croats, Serbs, Slovenes, and other Czechs and Slovaks and other Slavic people. So they were very afraid of that idea of maybe pan-Slavic idea. Mm -hmm. That always had a, as its um, secret or open sponsor, Russia, of course. But that this Russia is special topic, uh, and uh, the, the Russian politics toward uh, its um, Slavic brothers is something uh, that I could go on for ages. But that's uh, another topic. <laughs> but one of the theories, as I was looking for understanding um, that theory, was theory of. Uh, I mean, it's not theory. Uh, it's also a tool of arrested development. Um, it was a concept also that developed in social sciences and applied um, in Byzantine studies for some cases, uh, especially in, in Greece, among Greek scholars who actually went abroad, went to the US, and they developed that uh, theory, a theory of arrested development of the Greek nation, Greek idea with the coming of the barbarous Turks and the Turkish occupation and how, uh, because they were trying to, they were left-wing uh, scholars, and uh, they were trying not to sound nationalistic or hegemonistic, but they were trying, they were looking for a concept that would, um, in a way, um, uh, could form a foundation for Greek, at least intellectual and spiritual dominance in the Eastern Mediterranean, even after the, the fall of Byzantine emperors and all the way to the modern times. As I say to my students, always, you know, we think that Byzantium, actually Byzantine Empire uh, had fallen in the 15th century, but Byzantine world is still close to us. Uh, you still have, you know, four patriarchs of the traditional five Roman Pope being the, the five. Four patriarchs are Greeks, not Russian not Serbs, not some other Orthodox, they're still Greeks. So it's still this Byzantine hegemony in a way is still very well uh, and alive in the Eastern Mediterranean. And the island of Crete, for example, not my Cyprus, but Crete, also very nice island, is not a part of the Greek church, I mean, uh, of the church of the Greek state, it's a part of the Constantinopolitan, as we say, it, mm. church, ecumenical patriarch. So it's very, that's what I said. It's very complex. It's mm -hmm. very complicated, mm -hmm. and it's really hard uh, to 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 study things, to explain things in a simple way um, uh, to actually a scholarly audience. And I don't mean mm -hmm. this audience. I mean my fellow mm -hmm. Byzantine scholars. Mm -hmm. When you try to say something new, because they are so immersed in this positivistic thinking. When you say something new, you just they just discard that as no, that's not real scholarship. That's just your imagination. So this is my great opportunity to um, <laughs> state something, all the things that I have in my mind. This is just a timer. I will give you this presentation, of course. I won't read all this, but this is to show you because we will be here here forever. It's already time to <laughs> ten minutes. Go go. No, but what I wanted to tell you, not to go back to the Middle Ages, but we have to go back at least a century, 1918. <coughs> that's the creation, that's the original sin of the Yugoslav trouble. The creation of the kingdom of the Serbs, the Croats and the Slovenes after the, the, the end of the First World War. Um, 
people at those times, both Serbs and Croats, believed that was the solution. They will finally have freedom. But as we'll see, wait a second, here, I will go back to that slide. Mm -hmm. uh, it started with, a, with the problems. It was the imperfect union, and actually it became the root of the rivalry between the Serbs and the Croats. Mm -hmm. That was why, because they entered the, the union with different yeah. expectations and different promises, and if I... I think I can say so because I'm, I'm a Serb, because Serbs at the end managed to trick the Croats. Uh, not to, uh, they didn't, um, in a way, they promised them one thing, the Serbs did, and they delivered the other thing. But you have to understand, it's so many levels on, of national um, connections in the Balkans. So when I say the Croats, I mean uh, uh, what was then and it's roughly now Croatia. We have to understand in the in the in the former Austrian Hungarian Emperor, mm -hmm. the Croats have their own had their own parliament, and one third of that parliament was uh, um, comprised the Serbs comprised one third because that was the population of what was Croatia. The Serbs comprised one third of of population of the territory of Croatia. So it was so many levels of of connections, but that was the the the, the start. Of the problems because it brought out after the first world war all this, you know, because the Serbs and the Croats, the, when I say the Serbs, I mean the Serbs from Serbia proper, what what is now again Serbia, after our, our very successful uh, politics in the last century, we we came back to the borders of the the 1878 roughly. So uh, anyway, when I say Serbs, I mean Serbia. The Serbs from Serbia had no contact with uh, Croats, and very little contacts with Serbs and uh, from Bosnia and the Croats and the Muslims from Bosnia, Turks at the time. So the Serbs from Serbia have more contacts with Macedonia, what is now Macedonia, Eastern Bulgaria and uh, parts of Hungary and Romania. That was the kind of Serb ethnical uh, kernel, if you want, the, the, the main topic. So it was actually that's why it was imperfect union on so many levels because they didn't know each other and the Croats came from the parliamentary tradition of Austrian Hungarian Empire and the Serbs came from a pseudo democratic tradition of Serbia and after not four years of war, four years of world war, but actually with those two Balkan wars, six years of war. So those who managed to survive first world war and Serbia lost 60% of the male population of the first world, 60% of the male, I mean the population between 15 and 65, 60% of the male population, those who managed to survive expected to be treated as heroes. And that's not, of course, what I got from the Croats. So that was the first level. That is when they started, because Serbs and Croats didn't have, they didn't have disputes, never, not even in the Middle Ages. Uh, Serbs, and, Serbs and Croats, it's, it's the same people, different religion. Serbs are uh, Catholics, uh, Croats are Catholics, Serbs are Orthodox. But it's the same language, and we are really the same people. Some Serbs and some Croats don't want to admit it, but it's, it's really the same people. World War II was a total civil war, and that is, that is one of the... Uh, if this was the root, this was the the... the um, kind of, um, well, uh, how could I say it? Point. No, it, it's the, the, when you put it in practice, you know, all this frustration from these years spilled over to the crimes, terrible crimes of the civil war mm. that was going on in, in, in uh, former Yugoslavia in this period. It was the creation of satellite fascist states, actually. One was the independent state of Croatia. <laughs> And there was also fascist state in Serbia, and the independent state of Croatia comprised today's Croatia, the entire Bosnia and Herzegovina, and parts of today's Serbia, the <coughs> northern part of Serbia. And it was really terrible. That is when the thing started because the Serbs and Croats got frustrated. The Croats, once they got this independent state, they tried to cleanse it, to clean it of the Serbs, and they had a recipe. <clears throat> kill one third, 
uh, uh, not baptize, but you know, uh, uh, convert, convert the other third and expel the last third. So that was the recipe. They managed to do pretty good. Uh, that was really the, some crimes that are, it's it's like the with the, with the crimes uh, and, and the genocide in Srebrenica when people start counting victims, whether it was seven thousand mm. or three thousand or three hundred. It's it's the same because I mean it's not the same, but um, and the 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 characterization of the crime doesn't change with the number. Uh, the intent is also counts, and that that is that. Crime, also of course, serves. Uh, it's it's the cycle. It's, it's cycle the mimetic. The mimetic. The mimetic. Yeah. So it's the Croats started killing Serbs. The Serbs started killing killing Croats. So they went. People from the same village were starting to kill each other. Mm. And once the socialist Yugoslavia came, it was actually a revolution. When the, the Tito came to power, he blocked all that discourse. So nobody was, it's a false, false undifferentiation, yeah. uh, as mm. you would like to say. Mm. So it's, they did some crimes, you did some crimes, so let's not talk about it. Of course, when you don't talk about it, it just, you know, it bubbles up, bubbles up, bubbles up, and that's what spilled over in the, in the 1990s. That's what spilled over. Because the politics of the social Yugoslavia, and it was amazingly how they managed to do that for how many years, 45, 45 years almost half a century they managed. Well, actually, they did it until Tito died in 1980. And the last 10 years were just the prelude to the civil war <coughs> in the 1990s. So then, in the 1990s, let me see just, this is what I was telling. Uh, about the Second World, you know, the, the revenge of the oppressed, who were, the, mean, meaning the Croats, and mm. uh, the willing fool, sacrifice and victimization of the Serbs on the other part. Mm -hmm. You know, when the Serbian nationalistic movement started in the 1980s, uh, that was their main topic, victimization, or self-victimization. Some were talking about willing victimization, because it was really... Yeah. Uh, it, th those were, the, the in a way, intellectual basis for wh what uh, was about to come. And we all, uh, in a way, sensed it. I was very young then, but um, I, I'm slightly nationalist, I admit, as you know, people in high school tend to be. And also, I was always anti-communist, which is not to say that I'm anti-left, but anti-communist. I hated those communist politicians that all spoke the same. That is why Milosevic managed to come to power uh, because families like mine, who were not communists, not, not members of the party, uh, he was talking in different language. You know, th those people, the, this communist elite from all over Yugoslavia, they spoke the same language. This is the, 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 this language, artificial mm. administrational language that, you know, um, I will give you one example. My sister went to high school with a son of high rank functionary, and my father came back from this meeting with parents and he said you you'll never believe it he referred this guy he referred to his son as not mister at the time but comrade whatever his <laughs> last name was mm -hmm. and he didn't say my son he didn't say his first name he said comrade uh, i didn't know that comrade wasn't coming to school that was something like that you know like your case <laughs> so and you know you can imagine this so the nationalism first had this appeal of uh, novelty of writing, and then all these terrible things start to uh, come to the surface. So this is actually the, this word for Yugoslav heritage, as I call it, or whatever you like to call it. And I found a quote from Girard, uh, Girard's Berlin to the end. Uh, Conflict resolution often fa fails when two groups tend toward extremes. Th that was nationalisms brought to the extremes mm. no stopping we're gonna kill yours we're gonna kill two more we're gonna kill ten more gonna, so it was really never-ending cycle of not only violence but of mimesis of mm. imitating mm. each other and the more 
uh, people uh, start, uh, stated their difference from the other Serbs from the Croats. The Croats especially at the beginning from the Serbs because uh, in Bosnia everybody from each other. And then we go to next level now. Montenegrins mm -hmm. are so different from the Serbs. Mm -hmm. Although in the 19th century that was the the, we, we used to call it, I mean, they used to call it the Montenegro, the Piedmont, the Piedmont of, of Serbian nation. Because it, it really was. A, the nation creation process is not uh, over in the box. So th that is something, th th this forceful differentiation only stressed the, the sameness and the undifferentiation of, of the, all the actors, of all the sides. That is uh, one of the Mimetic theory is probably the best tool to understand yeah. Yugoslav. This is what I recall. We, we always uh, talked in, in the Balkans, in normal circles, about narcissism of small differences. But this is even one step further. There are no differences between those people. I, they go on Sunday, those people went to one church, the other went to the other. That's, I, I'm not sure you can call that difference. You know, in a way, of, there that's maybe a slight slightest of the difference, but they were the same people, and now after all these years, you see that all these Serbs who many of them fought against the Croats in the 1990s, and uh, many of them, even those who fought, unless they did something, some crimes, they all ran back to Croatia to get their land back, to get Croatian passport because Croatia is now in the European Union and Serbia is avant-garde of this, I don't know, anti-European Union movement in the Balkans, in a way that we are the only one now left after Macedonia mm -hmm. escaped. So uh, it's, it's amazing how people are uh, prone to accept propaganda. That was amazing to me when I was growing up in those years uh, I was an eyewitness of the people who, in 1988, for example, was a staunch communist, anti-Milosevic, anti-nationalist communist. After 1989, which was sixth century of the Battle of Kosovo, this famous myth, you know, about yeah. Serbian, yeah. the end of Serbian medieval empire, um, <coughs> the same people became staunchest nationalists uh, and uh, started going to church and they idolized Milosevic. After the fall of Milosevic, the same people became Democrats. Then they went another full circle. So it's, I was, that's really actually, it's, it's not only that I'm fascinated or amazed, I'm, I'm scared how easily people can be manipulated to, and how their basic, these basic fears and emotions can be uh, really taken to extremes by a most obvious propaganda. It's really something that scares me because now we have the, the most obvious propaganda in the most powerful country in the world, and that's really scared me. So uh, let me see what's this. This is a few points for the Yugoslavian case. It's it's an amazing mixture. So that's why all this uh, you know reconciliation groups fail. Because all are guilty, if you want to talk in those terms, yeah. in the same way. So all are, all, all are aggressors in the same um, uh, time as they are victims. So, so or in, in, in the same measure. So uh, maybe this now the late Hague Tribunal for the form. No, it's still working now. No, I don't know. Not anymore. Not anymore. That's only Ratko Mladic case, I think. Yeah, yeah, like but they, they moved they it. Yeah, yeah, so so that's you see all they're all guilty. Mm. I mean the Serbs, the Croats, the Muslims, and uh, was there anybody else? No, those three. Yeah, especially in Bosnia. Yeah, they're, they're all guilty, guilty, and in the in the same way as they're all innocent. So this is this unbelievable undifferentiation. So uh, it it is always the same. Uh, the aggressor that def that you know defends itself. Uh, is always choosing either to prevent the aggressor, the construed aggressor, or to uh, stress 
his its um, position as a victim, and this is the this sec second point: the, the sacrifice, uh, maybe willing for sacrifice, and the pre-empty victimization. So this is how you you uh, lay the foundation to defend your own aggression. Yeah. You, we have to be aggressive. We had to attack them because they were attacking us, or they used to attack us, or they will attack us. This is something that is, as always in the Balkans, taken to the extremes. So this is one, one of the cases. This is just a um, few topics for discussion: action and reaction, real and uh, versus ideological, political versus religious. I didn't talk too much about religion. I just mentioned it at the end, which is close. Uh, outside and inside perspectives, you know, even from this not so short talk, but it, you get a picture that it's very complicated. Yeah. Even for um, eyewitness, as myself, um, who knows all the actors, remembers stuff, and who was always looking to read between the lines, you know, even uh, when the events were happening, it is really uh, difficult not only to understand, but also to, to narrate in a linear, linear fashion, because it's really so intertwined. This is what I say, um, absolute similarities from the outside, so everybody is the same. That's, what, that's why they, they left us alone, they're all the same. All of them are the same. And when you look from the outside, this is, we are completely different. No, we don't have anything in common. That's really, that's really taken to the, to the extremes and um, this is something I just wanted to stress few open questions that I have in my mouth or doubts whether it was conflict of the elites as is now the predominant uh, opinion in this not only Serbian former Yugoslav scholarship that it was actually the conflict of the elites I'm not so sure about it or conflict of the peoples um, I know that the elites profited of course from the wars on all sides on all sides People became amazingly rich. Uh, the war profiteers, you know, the, 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 they became rich. Uh, the level, uh, the only these Russian oligarchs are richer than, than war profiteers from the Balkan Wars, including politicians, or actually starting with politicians. This is why I'm conflict of the elites. I'm, it's okay. I'm okay with the elites. Conflict, I'm not okay with it because the elites they were best friends, or they were talking and they were working in their own interest. For example, Serbian guy Milosevic was uh, always in contact with Croatian President Tuđman and they uh, very much not only respected each other, they worked together on many issues. Bosnia was just one topic. They played like you play the, the chess game. They played with Bosnian Serbs, Milosevic from Belgrade, Tuđman from Zagreb played with Bosnian Croats. They, because when they went to Dayton, Ohio, uh, when Bill Clinton brought them, he brought the president uh, Muslim of Muslims in Bosnia, and he brought Croatian president Tuđman and Serbian president Milosevic, who were not Bosnians. They were from, and they signed uh, this ridiculous in a way because it's not realistic um, and not. Uh, it's not working, this Dayton agreement, but it stopped the war. Uh, also, religion is a factor. I'm not sure that religion was much of a factor. It served just an, as another, or maybe it was, of course, but not in, it, it wasn't the primary factor. It served as an Instagram, um, uh, it's, it served as a tool, I think, more than it was a historical constant. You know, like, it sometimes it still likes to be presented especially in um, uh, some Western papers. Yeah. Like it's, no, they're just religious. Like I told David, Serbs and Croats also they are not that religious, mm -hmm. especially Serbs. Mm -hmm. They now go to churches in masses, you know. You can enter the church when it's some, you know, for Christmas and stuff like that, but uh, they're not really religious. Um, and also there are some, this is something that is a little bit scary, this Macedonian question is something that is going on forever. Mm. I mean, in modern history, for the last two centuries. So the Serbs, the Bulgarians, and the Greeks were fighting for Macedonia. And do you know who won? Albanians. Because Albanians are now um, 
comprising 40% of the population of Macedonia. These days, they will turn it into law, into constitution, that Macedonian is the official language. Uh, the Albanian is the official language of the Macedonian state. And the current pro-Western, pro-EU, pro-NATO government is a coalition between the Macedonian party, one party, and the uh, Albanian party. And the smartest, in a way, if you can say it, people in the, in the Balkans are Albanians in that way, because they know their goal, and they created what was stated in the program from the beginning of the 20th century Albanian, the Big Albania. So Albania, Kosovo now, and part of uh, Western Macedonia, not part, almost the entire Western Macedonia is, that, that's the, the uh, Big Albania. Mm. Uh, we see what was going to happen with Kosovo, it's not going to be part of Serbia for sure, and Serbs are much to blame for that, don't get me wrong, because Serbs got the Kosovo back in this uh, first Balkan war, war in 1912. That was the, the return to the sacred land. Yeah, Kosovo is right. Serbian sacred land. I don't know why. Well, <laughs> it's, a, it's a mythology, but you know, it's, if you want to go back in history, it was Byzantine land. And uh, it was some other land before that. But uh, when you talk about mimetic theory, Byzantium is actually, I, I have to write something about that. Because nobody, Byzantine scholars are so old fashioned, mm -hmm. most of them. Uh, imitation. In, uh, where do you find the, the, the highest level of imitation in Middle Ages, of course, mm -hmm. from Byzantium? I mean, in the Balkans. They all imitated uh, mm -hmm. Byzantine Roman Emperor. But to go, come back to Kosovo, uh, Spain is one of the five EU countries that didn't recognize yeah. Kosovo. Mm -hmm. So Kosovo is half a state, half protectorate. It's actually a criminal state. Uh, <laughs> it is, unfortunately. <laughs> it is. It's... it's, uh, uh, it's, it's the worst for Albanians, and I, when I say the Serbs, actually, so they, they they didn't call it Kosovo, they called it Old Serbia, when they conquered it back, re, they, they made a reconquest in 1912, but from 1912 until 1990, let's say, eight, when the war really started there, they didn't do absolutely nothing, and they treated Kosovo as a colony, and the Serbs from Kosovo, uh, sold their properties to the Albanians who buying and paying good prices, and the only thing Serbs want to do is, you know, dominate. So th that's really uh, you can blame other parts, but also Kosovo, Belgrade, Serbia missed their chance because Kosovo, Kosovo Albanian intellectuals, they all studied in Belgrade, and I remember, especially in the 1970s and 1980s. A lot of intellectuals uh, with a with a rock music, new wave, punk music uh, scene, uh, underground scene flourishing in Belgrade. Belgrade was really like, you know, we were not part. People make always mistake. We were not behind the Iron Curtain, never. I mean, from 1948 when Tito uh, uh, said no to Stalin, the famous, we were from we were in between, which means we had passports and we traveled freely everywhere. Even in the U.S., uh, it was until 1992. It was from 1992 until 2009, actually, that we had uh, restrictions and visas because of the wars and stuff like that. But before that, uh, you you know, Hungarians, Bulgarians, Poles, they all they didn't have passports. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So if they wanted to travel, they wanted to go and and get a passport for one journey and, and back. <coughs> so. We were in that sense, we always felt that's another, um, you know, <laughs> how we tried to heal our complex of, of inferiority by feeling superior than, let's say, Bulgarians and Poles and Hungarians, and we used to make fun of them <laughs> during the, before the, uh, the fall of the Berlin Wall. And Bosnia, I, I put Bosnia at the end. This is the end, yeah, it is the end, sorry. Uh, because this is something I, I I don't know what I could say, tell you about Bosnia. This is a, it's good that it's kind of protectorate now, because if you leave Bosnians alone, all Bosnians, uh, Serbs, Croats, and Muslims, uh, they will one day, you know, hug each other and kiss each other, and they will kill each other the next day. It's really, it's a, it's. Um, I don't want to go into too much into mentality thing, 
but it's really uh, difficult to to see the future for Bosnia, especially with uh, uh, Serbian extremists over there and their close relations to the Kremlin. I don't want to say with Russia. Russia is something else, and the current president of Russia is he's not Russian. You know, like Milosevic wasn't Serbia. He was Milosevic. So Putin is Putin. And Putin is now left in the Balkans only with uh, this Serb guy in Bosnia and with Serbia, whose Serbia is, you know, we need European money, so we won't say no to Europe because the Russians don't give us anything except brotherly love. Um, <laughs> but what, we, what is going on actually now, these days, uh, uh, something is starting in, in Serbia. And uh, it started last year. And now it's growing because we like riots and we like demonstrations and we like um, toppling our uh, kind of di dictators. Now in all major cities in Serbia for the last month or so, there are demonstrations and protests. I, I don't think you will hear it in news I think, uh, unless something seriously, some serious incident happens. And I hope you won't hear it in the news. But, uh, uh, I'm proud to say my faculty, my school, started uh, the, the support because Faculty of Philosophy is at the, at, we're really at the epicenter of Belgrade. We are the square from where all the protests against the, the regimes originate. And now we were the first among the, the, the faculties and universities to sign petition, and I'm very proud of that. I, I just signed it, but my friends did it, so they put me on like fifth <laughs> in, in, the, in, the, in the line. So I get a lot of phone calls from all of friends. So, so something is going on in Serbia because this guy who's now president uh, is leaning too much toward Putin. And but even worse, we don't care about that actually. In Serbia, he's stealing too much. It would be okay for us if he st would steal a little bit, but he steals too much. So there's another wave of, wave of changes coming in, in the Balkans. So stay tuned. <laughs> Thanks everybody. Thank Thanks you, for so for